If this will not do, let him reflect upon the fathers, whether it was not the universal practice of the fathers to confute latter heresies out of the scripture. This they did, either pertinently or solidly, and then it may be done still, or impertinently and saliciously. And then Mr. White makes them mere jungler, jugglers. Excuse me. In a word, as upon a supposition that Aristotle was authentic and Alphopsisus, it were no hard matter out of him to confute all the new opinions of the modern philosophers. So the scriptures being confessedly such, it may suffice for the confutation of latter heresies. Lastly, if all this was not severe, excuse me, if all this will not serve turn, it is, to use his own words, a shameless proposition to say the scripture doth not speak of the matters now in, controver uh, now in controversy between us and the papists, and whoever asserts it either understands not what he saith, or must be presumed never to have read any of our Protestant controvert controvertists who have fully confuted all the popish errors and heresies from express scriptures or which is all one from genuine consequences evidently deduced from them nor doth it matter at all to say the scripture treats not of the controversies at large since it is by all acknowledged that every part and parcel of scripture is canonical and authentic and the papists make this the difference between the divinity of the scriptures and conciliary decrees that these are divine in the main conclusion, but not in the premises or mediums, but the scripture, they say, is divine in all, every verse, every word being divine, and consequently, if but one verse of scripture speak against an error, it doth as solidly, though not so fully, confute that error, as if a whole book were written against it. For instance, that text, this is the true God, if the sense of the words be agreed, and if they be not, it would do nothing, though in a whole epistle were written about it. And so far, there is no difference. Doth as substantially confute the Socinian heresy in that point as a larger discourse upon it would do. And therefore, Mr. White's argument is empty and ineffectual, and must go after its fellows. And so all their arguments of any note against the scriptures being rule or judge of controversies are, I hope, sufficiently answered and the Protestant doctrine or truth of Christ, that is, the scripture is a sufficient rule or judge of controversies, stands like a rock at which their waves are dashed in pieces. And now I should come to the other part, by positive scriptures and arguments to prove the scripture authority and sufficiency. But this is fully done by many learned pens, only because our principal arguments for it are assaulted by their adversaries I now have to do with. I shall therefore consider their pretensions against the evidence of these places alleged by us in defense of the authority and sufficiency of the scriptures, for I am forced by them, against my own desire and inclination, to confound these two heads and treat of them together. I know there are several texts rightly urged by the Protestants and vainly caviled by the Papists, but against the handling of this point was not my first nor is my main design at present. And one solid argument or convincing scripture is as good as a thousand, and both parties are upon the matter willing their cause should stand or fall by the verdict of one place as it doth, or doth not convincingly prove the sufficiency of the holy scriptures, and because above all places the Romanists most eagerly combat this. I shall therefore more largely insist upon it, and clear up the force and evidence of it, notwithstanding all the clouds they cast before it. The place is 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 and 16. From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. To ingenuous and disinterested persons, the very reading of these words is a sufficient confutation of the popish opinion. But that you may see the Romanists have if no conscience yet, some wit, they are able to darken the clearest texts and to perplex what they cannot answer. Our arguments from this place are plain and cogent. Firstly, that which I can make a man, excuse me, that which can make a man wise unto salvation is sufficient for salvation. Secondly, that which is sufficient for the conferring of all those things which are necessary to salvation is sufficient for salvation. But so is the scripture. For there are but two things necessary to salvation, that is, knowledge of the truth and practice of righteousness and holiness. And for both these the scripture is said to be sufficient. 
Thirdly, that which is more sufficient for a man of God or minister is much more sufficient for a private Christian. But so is the scripture. Ergo, but let us see what our adversaries pretend against this evident place. Exception number one. It is able indeed, but that is through faith. It is not of itself sufficient saith our captain. It speaks not of making Timothy a Christian by the Bible, since it supposes that Timothy is being already made a Christian by Paul's institutions, but it speaks of the perfecting of his faith, not the first choice of it. And this faith is a belief of Christ, uh, excuse me, this faith is a belief of Christian verities delivered by oral tradition, saith Mr. Cressy in section 2, caption 6, and consonantly to him, Mr. White, thus glosseth upon the place, the scripture will contribute to thy salvation, so that thou understand them according to the faith of Jesus Christ, which I have orally delivered unto thee. Apology for Tradition, 16th Encounter. Answer, number one. The necessity of faith is no argument of the scripture's insufficiency. The scripture is sufficient, that is, in genere objecti in respect of the object, or doctrine, or revelation. And yet faith is necessary in genere instrumenten, instrumenti, as an instrument. For it is plain enough, the faith he speaks of is the grace, not the doctrine of faith. But this argument, scripture, and tradition together were no perfect rule. For both will not make a man wise unto salvation, otherwise than through faith. Answer number two. It is falsely supposed, and can never be proved, that the faith here spoken of is the fides quae creditor, or the doctrine of faith, not fides qua creditor, or the grace of faith. And that, by faith, are here intended Christian verities delivered by oral tradition from St. Paul or the other apostles. And this supposition is the basis of their answer. The contrary sufficiently appears from diverse considerations. First, this contradicts the apostles' scope, which apparently is to commend the scriptures as able to make wise the salvation. But this were no commendation at all to say they together with such Christian verities are sufficient for salvation, for according to this argument it might be said of any one verse in all the Old Testament what is here said of all the scriptures, that is, that that verse together with faith, that is, with the Christian verities delivered by oral tradition, is sufficient for salvation, which no papist will deny, and therefore that answer is absurd. Second Timothy's Faith here supposed is of the same kind with the faith of his mother and grandmother. Second Timothy 1 verse 5. When I call to remembrance the unfaded faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, was the faith of his grandmother too the Christian verities delivered by oral tradition from the apostles after she was dead? Thirdly, it is not said the scriptures are able with the faith, but through the faith, not soon Pisces, but dia Pisceso, uh, Pisesos, which plainly shows that this faith is not another object distinct from the scriptures, but an instrument to apply the scriptures, especially if we consider a parallel place, Hebrews 4, verse 2. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith, that is, with the grace of faith. For none can be so senseless as to think they were damned for want of oral tradition. Fourthly, the faith here spoken of is together with scriptures sufficient for salvation, and so is the grace of faith. But the dogmatical belief of Christian verities delivered by tradition, together with the scriptures, is not sufficient for salvation, as the papists confess. The grace of faith is the thing here spoken of. Fifthly, the faith here spoken of is a thing distinct and totally differing from the scriptures, and not at all coincident with them. But the Christian verities or traditions delivered by the apostle were not things so different, but coincident with the scripture, as evidently appears from Acts 26 verse 22, where St. Paul, in Terminus, professeth, he said, preached, none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. But I would have you to wit that the church of Rome know what Paul preached better than himself, a plain evidence of their infallibility. Exception number two. By this argument the scriptures of the Old Testament, for of them he speaks, are sufficient for salvation, and so the New Testament is not necessary. So the captain, page 29, and Cressy, you be supra. Answer number one. It is very true. The scriptures of the Old Testament were in those times sufficient for salvation. This appears from the place now cited in Acts 26, verse 22, compared with Acts 20, verse 27, where St. Paul saith he delivered the whole counsel of God. Hence I argue, the whole counsel of God was delivered by St. Paul and is sufficient for salvation. But all that St. Paul delivered was in Moses and in the prophets, Acts 26, verse 22. 
If the Old Testament was deficient in any doctrine, it was that which the New Testament seems to supply, that is, the doctrine of Christ. And yet the Old Testament was sufficient to teach Christ, for it did both instruct men about the person and office and work of the Messiah. As our doctrines do abundantly prove against the Jews, to whom I refer the reader, for the proof of it, and also did sufficiently prove that Jesus was the Christ, as appears undeniably from Acts 18, verse 28, and consequently there was no de a defect, there was no defect, excuse me, but a sufficiency for that time and condition of affairs, even in the Old Testament, in things necessary to salvation.